Uh, is it wise to use one time use to the inoscopes? Yes, it is. And the pro on this question is taken by none other than Ken Binmuller. So, Ken. Thank you, Dick. Well, I hope that the debate will be obviated after my talk because I hope to convince you this is really a no-brainer. I could also be up here trying to convince you that we should put airbags or seat belts into our cars. That would be the equivalent. I have no disclosures. So this is what your patients are reading. This is from the New York Times. It's from uh, 2019 in August. You can see on the right side, there's your duodenoscope and the duodenum and ERCP is being performed. And the title is, Why Are These Medical Instruments So Tough to Sterilize? Duodenoscopes have sickened hundreds of patients in hospital outbreaks. Now some experts are demanding the devices be redesigned or taken off the market. So that's what your patients are reading, and they're coming to you and they're asking questions. They're also reading about deadly superbugs, that there are 9,000 drug-resistant infections per year and 600 deaths from these superbugs. You can see such a superbug right up here to the right. It's on CNN as well. And your patients are connecting the dots. Endoscopes, superbugs, death. This one's titled Superbug Deaths Linked to Contaminated Endoscopes. That's what your patients are seeing. Here at Cedar sinai patients infected with superbug bacteria, 71 exposed. Across the street at UCLA, they also have superbugs and patients are under watch. And CNN, CNN is reporting the FDA has known devices can spread deadly bacteria. So when you start seeing this in CNN and you're reading deadly bacteria, then of course the superbug lawsuits follow, and we're seeing them. Here at Cedar sinai there was a class action lawsuit uh, filed across the street at UCLA as well. We're seeing that the endoscope manufacturers are being sued, here Olympus and Pentax, and even up in Canada, where they supposedly don't get have the lawsuits like we do in the U.S., there are lawsuits. The, this all started in 2013. Now, we've known about the issue of contamination of our duodenoscopes for a few decades, but it's only recently since we can actually tag these CREs because they have a molecular signature that we can actually identify the culprit as the duodenoscope. So this was that first report and this was a single center in Illinois, it was in Chicago, nine patients with positive cultures for CRE, and 27 additional patients colonized, and that got everyone's attention. So now, through 2017, 45 hospitals, 350 patients in infected. And the FDA, of course, got wind of this. So back in 2013, they immediately mandated that a voluntary post-market surveillance study be performed in a real-world setting. And the data took several years to collect, in part because the, the scope manufacturers were hesitating to actually collect this data, and they were perhaps afraid of what it might show. And what it did show was that there's a 9% contamination rate. They were expecting, that is to say the FDA, expecting a 0.4% contamination rate. So that's a significantly higher contamination rate. And the high concern organisms comprise 5.4%. So by high uh, concern, we mean those bugs that are associated with disease, the enteric bugs especially. And there was a 3.6% incidence of low moderate concern organism contamination. Now, we haven't heard a whole lot more recently in the last couple of years. But the MAUD reports to the FDA, they have been increasing. Actually, they've been massively increasing. We have reports of 1,115 duodenoscope infection and 79 associated deaths. So we're maybe not reading about this on the headlines, but it's out there. So I'm wondering whether we should start thinking about adding to our informed consent for ERCP you have a 1 in 10 chance of getting some bug and a 1 in 20 chance that it's a deadly 
super bug. Or if you prefer, you could just say, do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> well, do you? Because that's really where we're at with that type of risk of, of, uh, ten, of one in 10. But that's not even the real world setting. This is the real world setting. And this is a study from, uh, from Holland. And in this study, 20, 73 Dutch centers, there was no routine surveillance protocols being performed. In other words, no one was being observed. There was no Hawthorne effect. Four to six, there were four to six duodenos, duodenoscope sites cultured, and it showed that one out of five, actually more, 22% of the duodenoscopes were contaminated. And of those contaminations, they identified that 15% had a GI origin. So those are potentially those superbugs that we're talking about. So now we're talking about a one in five risk of getting an infection. Now, you might think, well, why don't we just clean the scopes more intensely or intensify that process? Well, this is interesting. Doug Rex did a study where he did double reprocessing using high-level disinfection. And when he started, 592 duodenoscopes cultured, the rate of contamination was 9.4% with double reprocessing. So they did everything. They cleaned the scopes beforehand. They put it through the automatic endoscope reprocessor. And then they did it again, and it came out at 10% positive. Now, they changed some things in phase two, especially the pre-cleaning solution and how intensely that was administered. And the rate did drop, but it was still 5%, so it's still high. And then they started doing spot audit checks. That's phase three. So this is all prospectively collected and the rate was still 5%, so it hadn't changed. So just in cleaning these scopes more intensely doesn't solve the problem. Now, where is the problem, actually? We've been hearing about the elevator. Obviously, there are lots of nooks and crannies there that are hard to clean. This is a study from Holland, and it showed that there are damage in deposits around the lever axes, axes forceps elevator, the elevator screws, they were unable to reach many of these deposits with brushes, and they were poorly accessible for rinsing and drying. But what's really interesting is if you look at the boroscope picture, that's where you're passing something like a spyglass through the working channel, and they're seeing cracks in the working channel, and they're seeing frayed fibers in the channel. So it's not just an elevator problem. So the FDA started in April of last year. They recommended a transition to duodenoscopes with innovative designs to enhance safety. So it's no longer business as usual, folks. Something has to change. The FDA is telling us something has to change. So either we're going to go to disposable components or we're going to go to fully disposable duodenoscopes when they become available. And they became available in December. Um, and Upon that, the FDA announced the clearance of the disposable duodenoscope and stated improving the safety of duodenoscopes is a top priority of the FDA since such devices remain critical to life-saving care for many patients. So that's a pretty strong statement. It's a top priority for the FDA. That means it's got to be a top priority for us too because we always listen to the FDA. None of us like going to jail. All right, so... This is the study that um, Raman Muthasami, it's in press right now, that's the clinical evaluation of this single-use duodenoscope that you had the opportunity to see yesterday and a marvelous performance by Simon and uh, David. That performance alone should have obviated the need for any debate here. But nonetheless, this multi-center trial showed that really the ability to perform ERCP is essentially equivalent. Only two patients had to cross over to a reusable uh, scope. The level of satisfaction was practically equivalent, no difference in complication rates. Now, of course, the, what you immediately hear is, but well, what about the waste? So you see here, we're dumping this disposable duodenoscope. There's Simon, there's David, the masters, and I'm there to pitch in to throwing away a duodenoscope, something that I admit is a little hard, it was very hard for me to quote swallow, but if you think about it, 
The reusable scopes have a lot of disposables as well. It's just not the duodena scope. But what you're disposing are all that protective wear that the uh, personnel have to wear to clean and it has to be changed multiple times during the cleaning process. It's a very complicated process of 150 steps and there are multiple containers all made of plastic. Those also are thrown away. And then there's the harsh chemicals and bioaccumulative toxins get, get flushed away. So I wonder where that's all going as well into our waters. So it's not like when you use a reusable scope, there isn't medical waste. There's a lot of medical waste. It's just different medical waste. So we can and we should recycle medical waste. That really should be what we're fighting for. We have to put pressure on industry and the hospitals to recycle all of our medical waste because it's ridiculous what we throw away every day in our suites and the ORs. And there are companies that will recycle medical waste. We just have to make use of them and we should ask industry to also form partnerships with them. We should not be really throwing these away. They need to be recycled. So what about cost? Obviously, any new technology is going to cost a lot in the beginning. That's just the nature of the beast. There has to be some return on investment for industry. Everyone benefits from that. Now, this is the study, Shyam study from um, Orlando in Florida. At their center, low-volume centers, what they concluded in this study, by the way, is that at low-volume centers, the break-even cost for a disposable duodenal scope is $1,300. If you're a large volume center, the break-even cost is $800. So then you're probably thinking, okay, so if I'm going to switch to a disposable scope, that's got to be the price. Well, it's going to be higher than that. And by the way, the authors in the, at the author's facility, they maintain that a du disposable duodena scope would uh, cost 10 times more than the current cost per case. But if it's, if it's going to be higher than that, and what you have to account for are all of the hidden real-world costs. Because if you look at the amount of intensity required to clean these scopes, it's mind-boggling. When you look at the 150 steps that the personnel that clean these scopes have to go through with a minimum of 76 minutes, so over an hour per scope, with hands-on staff time for cleaning, and it requires extensive training and close supervision. There's actually a lot of turnover on these personnel because they're exposed to these toxins, you know, the whole day. The materials they're uni using, they cost for cleaning, storage, and the uh, protective equipment, as mentioned. The regulatory is so onerous, the inspections, the audits, the certifications, the paperwork. So you already need a middle layer of, of, of people just to manage the regulatory and then, of course, there are the procedure delays for reprocessing and for repairs. And it's, but it's really the what if coughs that the hospital should be worried about. The patient, if a patient does get infected, what's the cost of that going to be? If staff gets infected, because the staff can, is also exposed to these superbugs, and what about the toxin exposure? They can become ill. And of course, if you get a lawsuit. Is avoiding this worth the cost? See, this is what you can wake up when you look at the morning paper and you could be reading this, that the superbug infects patients at your hospital. And I guarantee you, if the CEO or the CFO reads this, they're not having a good, nice day either. So the question is, is safety worth the cost? And when it comes to you and your family, safety is worth the cost, right? That's why the car manufacturers advertise safety. You can see it goes way back to this uh, Oldsmobile back in the 1950s probably or something. Think twice of their safety. So if it's for you or your family, yes, safety is worth it. It's just a problem when it's not directly just affecting you or your loved ones. Now everybody pays lip service to the safety of the airplane, but nobody's prepared to pay for it. But of course no one wants to be part of that flight like shown below. So the compromise, and we always need to make compromises with our administrators and our bean counters at the hospital, is to start with selective high-risk indications. And we've identified those. So let's start with a high-risk patient who's immunocompromised, has had a prior infection, is on antibiotics or an inpatient. 
or has high-risk pathology, cholangiocarcinoma, or a contaminated CBD from a prior ERCP, or a high-risk intervention such as stenting. So this is a study that actually delineates what are the high-risk indications. So let's just select those to start with. And after all, that's how they started to introduce the disposable uh, bronchoscope in pulmonology. And it's been around for several years. So there's already proven vac uh, uh, value to a disposable endoscope in pulmonology. So we can learn from that. They started with selective use in the ICU and the OR, but now it is spreading to the endosuite. They have a penetration of 21% in the US, where cost obviously is of greater consideration. In Europe, it's 26%. In Asia and Pacific, it's over 50%. So I think we can expect to see the same evolution in the GI space. There's also added value to a disposable endoscope. Yes, it's portable for us in the ICU and ORs, there is an ergonomic advantage because it is much lighter and is customizable for the endoscopist. So we can now have right and left-handed versions if you're, you know, left-handed. Um, knobs in different sizes. So if someone has a smaller hand, you can ask for that customized single-use duodenoscope with smaller knobs. Customizable, customizable for the procedure. Because it's a one-time use scope, you can say, I want to scope with a six millimeter channel. I want to have two channels, three channels, whatever you want. I want to have confocal optics. I want MBI, whatever you like, it can be integrated into that scope. I want a super long scope because I have a Ruin Y. No problem, you can order that. So this really opens up so many more possibilities for us and what excites me as a lover of innovation in endoscopy is device innovation. We can now finally integrate scope and device. We're no longer held hostage, a slave to the design of the reusable endoscope. So I think this is really a no brainer. Reprocessing scopes is simply a flawed process, period. So we, we know we cannot eliminate the infection risk. We can never tell the patient you have no risk of getting that superbug. And unless you can tell your patient, think of it yourself or your loved one that, then this is a flawed process. So why invest more money into a flawed process? This is here to stay. It's only going to cost more down the road. The cost of reprocessing is already prohibitive. It will only increase. The cost of disposables, on the other hand, and we know this from our work, it's going to come down, right? We know what expandable metal stents used to cost in the very, very beginning. It will come down, and we love it when there's competition. We want more industry partners to develop these. It's better for the patient. It's better for the endoscopist because it's more ergonomically friendly. You can customize to your needs. For your staff, those who clean your scopes, and it's actually better for the environment. That argument against throwing a disposable scope is actually an argument for it, provided you recycle. So hopefully I have convinced you to go disposable, and this is what I'm ordering. I want to be able to endoscope all orifices at one time with this multi-scope multi, multi, uh, multi device. All right, thank you. Okay.